Well, hey, and good evening, everybody. Hope you are doing well. I'm glad to be streaming. I know it's a little bit later than we normally stream, but I really haven't streamed that much lately at all. My schedule has been absolutely crazy. Unfortunately, I've been like all over the place. I haven't even been in Nashville where I'm where I live. I don't think really more than 24 hours this month. The Lord sent me on assignment to minister in just different, all kinds of different places. And so finally back, glad to be here. Hopefully you guys have missed me. I definitely have missed you, but I'm glad that we're going to be able to, to be able to dive into our continued coverage of the Brian Koberger case. Uh, the reporter from the Daily Mail, the one that's been like featured on Dr. Phil and News Nation and pretty much all the channels that we've been keeping track of for coverage of this case has a new theory. We're going to unpack that. Sleuthy Goosey has been just deep diving on several different aspects through Twitter. Jennifer Koffendoffer has some new information that I want to share with you. So I can't promise we're going to have like the world's longest stream tonight. I'm pretty tired as is. And it's already really late as we're getting started. But this was the soonest I could get started. So, lot to unpack, lot to think about, lots to bag, you know, to dive into tonight. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a really interesting stream. I'd love to know where you're watching from. I'm coming to you live from Nashville, Tennessee, and I also just want to take a second and uh, say a special hello to all the members of our Feller fam. You guys are so important. You really are the engine of what we do here. So we can't do what we do unless people. Like the Feller fam are here to support us with their uh, monthly support, the little flags next to your name, and even uh, just emotional encouragement of what we're doing here. So I wanted to say to everybody who has a little flag next to your name, thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing here. It really means the world. And uh, I do want to let you guys know, too, that this channel is totally crowdfunded, which means we're not able to continue to create content unless people like you come alongside and support us. And so uh, I want to just extend an invitation for people to come in and support us tonight. You can support us through PayPal, which is Tyler Feller, Cash App, which is maybe the best way to give because there's no fees, dollar sign Tyler Feller 22, or Venmo, which is at Tyler hyphen Feller. If you're unable, oh, you can also support through Super Sticker and Super Chat. If you're unable to support financially today, you can also support um, just through hitting the like button on the video or subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. We're supported too. Um, by when you go download this app called Swagit. And so you can actually win $250. We'll be giving away $250 in just a couple of days from that app. So go download the app, click the link, download the app, follow me. It's just at Tyler Feller on the app, no spaces. And then anybody who follows me is automatically entered to win $250 uh, from the Swagit app. So there we go. Good news. Great to see everybody tuning in. Appreciate your guys' support. Amy Heights, thank you for that super sticker. Naomi, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Karenza, thank you for that super sticker. We're definitely probably the lowest <laughs> month of super stickers in the history of the channel, which is my fault, not your guys' fault. My fault for not streaming and creating an opportunity for people to support us. Uh, but for those of you guys that do support us, especially those of you guys who are part of our ministry and support us in other ways through recurring giving and things like that, I just want to say thank you so much because uh, you're able to really help uh, spread the message of what we're doing to a lot of different people uh, this month. Okay, so I want to deep dive into uh, some of the tweets and different things that are going on that Sleuthy Goosey came up with. She's really smart. She was on the show the other day. I don't know when. Maybe the last time that we streamed. That wasn't a Faith Friday service. But she said this. She said, interesting. When I looked at this again, it very much read like an appeal to the DoorDash driver. December 7th, they received back the info from DoorDash. Maddie's Tinder account and the 19 redacted Tinder profiles. So essentially what Sleuthy Goosey is doing, she's taking the list of... Uh, data that they were able to receive back. Like, for example, they served a warrant to DoorDash to give them all of the deliveries that was received uh, to 1122 King Road from January 1st to present. Well, on December 7th, they got that back. December 7th, uh, warrant returned from DoorDash for all deliveries to 1122 King Road. So what Sleuthy Goosey did was then say, all right, well, let's go look at the press release from December 7th and just see what's going on. Like if there's anything on there worth talking about. Hey, Trish, thank you for your super sticker. Really appreciate that. Naomi, appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Lauren, it's good to see you tonight. Hope you're doing well. 
Thank you for that super sticker. Hey, Jamie, you said, I appreciate what you do and all your hard work that you put in. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you for appreciating that. Even like on the days that I wasn't able to stream, I tried to create a video that at least had the most uh, updated and, and latest breaking information in the Brian Koberger case. So it's like, gosh, I don't have the time uh, just because of some of the assignments that I have right now to be able to stream. Uh, but I do have the ability uh, to make a short video. And so I was making short videos to the best of my ability. And honestly, today, Jamie, was one of those days where I'm like, I have the time, but I'm really tired. Should I get some rest or should I stream? Uh, and by getting rest, I said, you know, I was thinking like, well, maybe I should. Um, uh, just do a quick video, like a, you know, like a, a 10 minute video talking about the new theory from daily the Daily Mail report, but instead I was like, you know what? We haven't streamed in a long time. I'm going to push through my tiredness and be here with you. So, But thank you, Jamie, for just appreciating, even on the days that I haven't been able to stream, uh, the ability to, um, you know what I mean, to, to create content for you guys. So, hey, Bill, thank you for that super sticker. Appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, Sleuthy Goosey makes it easy for us. She highlights the things that we are supposed to be looking at. So she's saying December 6th, they sent a warrant out for DoorDash. December 7th, that warrant was returned. And then on December 7th, they sent out this press release. The Moscow Police Department communications team are asking for the community's help. Detectives are interested in speaking with the occupants of a white 2011-2013 Hyundai Elantra with an unknown license plate. We now know that that's the wrong license plate. Tips and leads have led investigators to look for additional information about a vehicle in the immediate area of the King Road residence during the early morning hours of November 13th. Investigators believe the occupants of this vehicle may have critical information to share regarding this case. If you uh, know or own a vehicle matching the description or know anyone who may have been called this tip line. So essentially, since that uh, DoorDash driver was delivering that uh that package at 4 a.m. And they believe that Brian Kober entered the house at 4.04 a.m. Essentially, what they're saying is, hey, this is from Sleuthy Goosey's perspective. Hey, DoorDash driver, uh, did you happen to see a white Hyundai Elantra? And this could have very well been the first time that, uh, that they're talking about uh, that uh, white Hyundai Elantra. Nola lady says, remember the body cam from the noise complaint, the same cop who is familiar with the area, according to after David, didn't know he was at 1122 Kings Road. He's kept saying Queens Road. Yeah, that's not a fair statement because Queens Road and Kings Road are the same road. Like it's literally Queens Road for some reason, all of a sudden turns into King Road for no reason. So I don't think that's a fair thing to say. Sleuthy says, remember this. I wonder what vehicle that was, was it the unmarked police car? And police went and collected the footage. Anyway, let's see what she posted. 245 to 315 white colored sedan on CCTV. That's good. Officer Tadesh and Rosendahl in plain clothes in an unmarked police car working alcohol enforcement when they spot 30 males at 70 West Taylor. Okay, we saw that. 252, Maddie's third call to Jack D. 252, Kaylee's seventh and final call to Jack D. So she's pulling that out. And then the response was, now I want to know why the DoorDash driver didn't come forward. And from my perspective, at some point they did come forward. But maybe I'm wrong. We're going to unpack it. Hey, Naomi, thank you for that super sticker. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, did they come forward anonymously and then the warrant was ordered to reveal the driver's identity? Or did they pull the search warrant and get data back from the victim's phones and find out there was a DoorDash delivery and then they came forward? Why did they have to identify the driver? Approximately 4 a.m., this is with the exception of Colonel Odell, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. So the DoorDash delivery guy reported the information. It's just a matter of when did the DoorDash driver <clears throat> report the information. He reported after that warrant or before the warrant. Um, they mentioned the person who gave the girls right home came forward, but only applied they're looking for the DoorDash driver. That's odd. Um, also, funny story my teens decided to do DoorDash during the pandemic. They were urged to get ring for cars for their safety. 
we purchased them and of course they did for a week and then they quit. I was out the money. Although they still have ring car ring cameras. DoorDash, Uber, they should all have dash cams for their safety. I agree with that. The Elantra went to law enforcement November 25th. So November 25th, uh, Moscow Police Department asked law enforcement to be on the lookout for that white Hyundai Elantra. On November 29th, the Washington State Police told them that they found that 2015 white Hyundai Elantra. So, uh, very interesting. What do you guys think about this? I think it's interesting pieces of information to to sort of unpack. Hey, Amy Heights, thank you for that super sticker. Really appreciate your support. Our super sticker train conductor, an amazing mod. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, did Xana answer the door? Was Brian Koberger watching? There's a lot of things about that DoorDash driver that I find compelling. Is the DoorDash driver actually a, a witness and was scared himself or herself? We don't know the gender of the DoorDash driver. And I would just encourage people, like, Unless you absolutely have to do it as part of your, you know, way to make ends meet, like door dashing at 4 a.m. is not the most, you know, opportune or safe time to participate in that that line of work. Hey, Patty, thank you for that super sticker. Appreciate your support. Uh, would have expected DoorDash to be the immediate focus for law enforcement. Seeing how the estimated time of death was 3 to 4 a.m., law enforcement should have definitely found evidence of the delivery and the receipt with time noted. Yeah, because I think it's really interesting. Like, what are the actual chances that Brian Koberg would enter the house at 4.04 a.m. and there would be a DoorDash delivery at 4 a.m.? Like, I've rarely heard of... DoorDash deliveries happening at four in the morning. I mean, an hour and a half later, people are, you know, the early morning risers are waking up and starting their morning routine and morning deliveries are about to go out. Coffee shops are about to open up, you know? So like the 4 a.m. thing's a little confusing. And I was actually just in the town where I went to college at, met with my college pastor, who, by the way, has a great memory. And we had an amazing conversation and discussion of just like what life was like when I was in college. It helped me, you know, remember some of the things that we did. And I certainly was definitely up at 4 a.m. quite a bit, but I don't ever remember going to eat or getting food at 4 a.m. Certainly there, I don't remember ever us using DoorDash or anything like that, but there was a Taco Bell next to our campus and we went there quite a bit. Like we went to that Taco Bell like quite a bit. But <clears throat> at four in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. would be our max. So I don't know. I think it's interesting. 4 a.m. DoorDash. So Sleuthy has some other tweets, too, I want to show you because she's just been working her way down this. Um, she said she's revisiting this three months later, have an additional intro and several things stuck out to me. I wonder if anything stuck out to you. I'm going to ask that same question. So let's play this video. That is the Gonsalves family meeting with Fox news. This is when they were revealing information at the time that none of us had. Uh, certainly they, you know, at least have insight, if not actual information that the rest of us don't have. But as we play it and as we watch it, I want to hear, are you guys hearing anything that they're saying that, that you haven't thought of from a different perspective i mean there's probably going to be things they say you're like well i already knew that that's not we're not on the hunt for new information we're on the hunt for new insight and so um we listen to it let me know what your new insight is knowing what you know now based on what it is they say and i think that that's really important for us to do is we're continuing to unpack this case and by the way i think brian koberger is guilty and i'm not ashamed to say that for people who try to like say it's wrong to say that, I think Brian Koberger is guilty. Keyword, think. And he's been arrested and charged with four crimes. And one of the things that I think we're doing by continuing our coverage on this is making sure that, you know, we're understanding the case in its full breadth. So, yeah, I think Brian Koberger is guilty. 
He's obviously going to have to go to trial and be convicted by a jury of his peers. I think he's guilty. Um, by the way, guys, one of the things that we do on this channel, just as a way to get support uh, or allow people opportunity to support us, invite support, is we do this thing called the Super Sticker Train. And so uh, we do it like once an hour. And it's a different amount on the Super Sticker Train or Super Chat Train every single time. But this first hour of the show, since we haven't had a train in a while, I'm wondering if we can get up to 15 Super Stickers on the Super Sticker Train just as a way uh, for you guys to show your guys' support. So if you're interested in helping us out, I want to invite you to be one of the people who support our channel. We're going to go after 20 Super Stickers this hour. It may have well been preserved because the phone was passed around between one of the fraternity members and the girls, one of them unfortunately witnessed the death, the body there. Can you confirm that? Oh, we cannot actually. We know nothing about that whole phone call we've asked. And, and it's, I mean, I know that a lot of people want to know, but. It was interesting to see how Steve Gonsalves breathed really heavily just then. <clears throat> about that whole phone call we've asked. And, and it's, I mean, I know that a lot of people want to know, but that's just not our agenda. We just are like, somebody called 911. Somebody was reported unconscious. We don't really know. I mean, we've heard so many different things and nothing has been clarified or, or been told to us at all. And, and I mean, I don't know if I personally have asked yeah. anything about that. I don't know if you've asked that, but um, we know that this is getting three weeks in and it's starting to get, we don't want it to go cold. Um, we're, we're reaching out. I've reached out to uh, friends down in California today that have uh, connections that we're hoping to get raise some money to get a reward, to get a private investigator. Um, third party. Third party. Why, why go the private route? Do y'all worry that at the end of this week that this case may be cold? We're, we're scared. When you we're tell scared. me you don't want a, 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 a photo up there with the reward offering information, that kind of sounds like you're trying to like suppress the story. I mean, why do you not need help? But hey, I could be wrong. And you officers, I apologize if I'm wrong. Yeah. I want to please forgive me. Please forgive me. But if but if Oh yeah, this was the alpha male interview. Anything sticking out to you guys yet? Let me know. I'd love to know in the chat. If you don't have the information, people do know. If they don't, then, you Give know, we, the community, this is a community that is IT based. These guys live a digital footprint like we've never, all of us older people, we don't know how much that digital footprint could be helpful. So that's what we asked for. I hope like a DNA, uh, a family lineage, if they could come out here and just start taking, this town is not that big. We could figure out this and it might not be him. It might be a family member. We have family all going to the school together you know there's cousins there's aunts there's uncles we could yeah. find this guy Those, just uh, with volunteers Lenny, Lenny edge companies where are yeah yeah Let's put yeah. idaho on the map i, I want to know what you guys if you had any perspective of what he was saying hayden said respect great scene at james river church a couple of days ago hayden did you did did we meet each other there let me know if you were there i would i really wanted to talk to you I know you had mentioned before about coming to Springfield, and then I didn't have a way to get in touch with you because I've only talked to you through the chat on this channel. But I'd love to connect with you. And uh, if you go to James River, I'd love to hear about it. And if you were there, I'd love to hear your perspective of the services that we did. I was there, obviously, with Randy Clark, and we uh, hosted the last two days of the Week of Power is what it was called. I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you for your super chat. Joan, thank you. Naomi, Patty, Sue. Sue Olson, how are you? Good to see you. Naomi, thank you guys for your support. That takes us to six on our super sticker train. All right, let's read the comments to see what people are saying after that interview. So Sleuth the Goose says, have an additional inform. Several things stuck out to me. Wondering if anything stuck out to you. Reporter says, one of the survivors witnessed the death in the body there. And could they confirm it? Parents didn't know. He was absolutely right about the things that solved this case from the DNA to the digital tracking. And he didn't know what he didn't know at the time. Afraid one more week it would go cold. One more week would be around the time Brian Koberger and dad was leaving. Mr. G refers to a him 
friends in California have connections third party. Uh, boy, so much to unpack here. The connections in California. That's sticking out to people. I don't know. That wasn't really sticking out to me. Uh, oh, Hayden says, I didn't meet but was there. We'll connect ne next time. For sure, man. At, like, add me on, on social media or something or send me an email. That way I have a way to get, connect, get in touch with you. Uh, thank you for your super chat. Hey, Chris Hoyt, good to see you. Thank you for your super chat. Is that sticking out to you guys at all, the connections in California? Clearly the cops weren't telling them much more than they were telling the public. Also, this was super interesting. Look back on DNA lineage. I thought it would that stuck out to me the the DNA lineage tracking because it's like they had the DNA of the of of Brian Koberger essentially on the sheath, and we didn't necessarily know that. But just thinking through a perspective of how are they going to be able to get down to the bottom of it? Well, there's certainly one way you can try to get down to the bottom of it. See the DNA lineage tracking, swabbing the entire community for DNA. I wasn't behind that. I I mean I wasn't against that idea. Aside from being unconstitutional, prohibitively expensive, it wouldn't have found Brian Koberger. You never know. It might not be him who is him. Possibly C was just pointing in general. Ethan's brother, Hunter, the frat boy. Dad tries steering the occupation of everyone. If there's... Okay. Well, interesting. It's just interesting to go back and listen to it. I agree with Sleuthy Goosey. I'm not... There was nothing that really stuck out to me in particular about... Steve Gonzalez saying that other than the fact that they mentioned the DNA lineage tracking, which is what they were doing. They were, you know, going to all the big DNA companies and saying, Hey, here's the DNA we have. Do you have any cousins? And I think there was one report of them saying they found a third cousin to whoever the DNA belonged to. So they'd have to build out all the family trees of everybody. Not a bad way and a pretty creative way to get down to the bottom of solving crimes. I would remind you of what Dale Carson said, who is, a high-profile attorney and former FBI agent who was he heavily in involved uh, with, like, the Ted Bundy case, for example, said on the show whenever he was on here with us, do not, his advice is do not ever use any of those DNA uh, places. So I'm going to listen to him. I'm not going to use one of those DNA places. Mm -mm. All right, Sleuthy says, I'm wondering what the reason this would be that they knew the private party driver was but did not reach out to him for an interview as one of the very last people in the presence of Maddie and Kaylee. Great, great and question. They would have talked. What did That's another great question. The police have a lot more, um, you know, machinery and techn you know, technological ability than sometimes we do to track people down. I assume that the police would have found him and that they would have talked. What did he say about being able to tell everything he told you uh, to the police. Right. Yeah, this was super interesting to me because he said that uh, he didn't hear about the murders until the next day. And he realized, oh, my gosh, these are the two girls that I had driven home and I've driven home in the past. And so he was stewing on that for a little bit. But he was the one who eventually turned himself over to the police by calling the tip line saying, hey, I was the one who drove these girls home. The police tells the rideshare driver that they already knew he was the driver, but even still, he was the one who called in himself and said, hey, I was that guy. That being said, when he did that, called the tip line, he turned over all of his GPS coordinates from that night, sharing that he went to Taco Bell after dropping the girls off and then went home. And so that's the reason why he was cleared almost immediately, He'd never been named as a suspect or a person of interest because all the data that he provided to the police proves that he was not there at this house at the time that these murders allegedly happened. The police have a lot more. Um... Okay. Brian Koberger remained a teacher's assistant until the end of the semester. Brian Koberger's father said that they were told over a loudspeaker that the house was surrounded and their door was broken during the arrest. So, as stated before, not a no-knock warrant. Also... Was the dad awake at 1.30 a.m. as well? That's a great, absolutely great question. Was Brian Koberger's dad awake at 1.30 as well? 
because they if my assumption was that Brian Koberger was standing around in the kitchen separating all the trash so his parents didn't know what he was doing. But if his dad was awake at 1.30 in the morning, then his dad would have likely been able to realize and see, you know what I mean, that that Brian Koberger was doing something that's really unusual. It was so interesting, too, like the number, the sheer velocity number of people who came out and said that it's normal to wear gloves and separate your trash. Uh, I'm just here to say, no, that's not normal. I've never heard anybody ever in the history of the world ever in my life, ever. And I'm somebody who's talked to a lot of people as a pastor about things that they have going on in their life. No one has ever said they separate their trash with wearing gloves into Ziploc bags in the middle of the night when their parents are sleeping. So their DNA is not on the trash. No one has ever said that. And the sheer number of people who've came out and said that that was normal really tells me that we have a problem in our society with either just like dead brain cells or, you know, the ability to be swayed by somebody who's a massive narcissist as Brian Koberger is. Year old Koberger remained a teacher's assistant working towards his criminology PhD until the end of the semester before driving 2,500 miles to Pennsylvania with his father. His lawyer now telling ABC News that on that journey, he was pulled over twice for traffic violations in Indiana while driving that white Hyundai Elantra authorities have been looking for. Brian arrested in an early morning SWAT team raid at his parents' home in a gated community over two weeks later. The bar telling ABC News, Brian's father said they were told over a loudspeaker that the house was surrounded and their door was broken during the arrest. People, 28-year-old Koberger remained a teacher's assistant working towards his criminology PhD until the end of the semester before driving 2,500 miles to Pennsylvania with his father. His lawyer now telling ABC News that on that journey, he was pulled over twice for traffic violations in Indiana while driving that white Hyundai Elantra authorities have been looking for. Brian arrested in an early morning SWAT team raid at his parents' home in a gated community over two weeks later. The bar telling ABC News, Brian's father said they were told over a loudspeaker that the house was surrounded and their door was broken. I guess what could have happened would be Brian Koberger's dad was woken up by the loudspeakers. I mean, that's definitely a possibility, right? Hey, Naomi, thank you for that super sticker. That's number nine. We're trying to get to 20 on our super sticker train. Invitation for people to support us. Thank you, Naomi, for your major support today. I also want to remind you guys about the amazing new app that I'm a part of called Swagit. If you download that app and follow me, you're automatically entered to win $250 this month. I've pinned a link to it in the chat. Click that link, download the app, follow me. You're entered to win $250. Um, honestly... One of the top combos I've had in a while. Tons of respect for how educated about this case Scarlett is. It's hard to do. That was info at one point. I threw the whole life completely off topic. Just letting you know ahead of time. Oh, what is this? Oh, my gosh. We're not doing a four-hour. Here's a four-hour live with Sleuthy. So I would just say if you want to listen to Sleuthy Goosey talk for four hours, then that would be a great show for you to go do that at. It's on our Twitter page. Nola Lady says, why would he wipe down the sheath? Did he know he was going to lose it in the struggle? Why did he not leave the sheath in the car? Anya says, on a related note, why a stock image of the car, not a photo from the video footage they claim to have? I know, that's. I was curious about that as well. I, I was super curious about that. Is what? What? Tell me why you guys think they did that? Because it definitely didn't make any sense to me. It definitely didn't make any sense to me. They're just using a stock photo when they actually are telling us they have footage. Uh, I I don't know why they didn't show us footage. It's like the time <laughs> that we were studying the Kylie Rodney case and they put the picture of that Honda CRV up and it was like Kylie's actual Honda. And then like a couple days later, they show us a picture of a different Honda CRV. 
And then the one they pull out of the water looks different than the two they even showed us to begin with. It's like, why can't they just show us what they have and just say, this is what we have. So, and it wasn't even the right year. Nola lady says, dressed like a ninja with a knife in one hand and a sheath in the other hand, went on a murdering spree. Then stays in town knowing everyone is looking for a white car. What does he do? He registered it. It's a great point. That's actually pretty funny. Why would he do that? He's like, everybody in town is going around looking for a white Hyundai Elantra. So his response, as they're looking for a white Hyundai Elantra, is like, you know what? I'm going to go register it at the DMV, actually. I'm just going to. I'm just going to go register my car at the DMV. And one of the things you can do as a college student is like, you don't have to get the residence of where your dorm is at. You can, as a student, maintain your residence of, of your state of origin. And so like what would have made more sense if he would have just renewed his tags from Pennsylvania? I mean, I don't, know what he was thinking that is a really good point it's like everybody's looking for my car so uh yeah i'm gonna just go register it down at the dmv that way they have it on file you know my old license plates and my new license plates i'm gonna go register it now for somebody that they keep saying is basically like a genius uh i'm gonna say that that was definitely not the case <laughs> with brian koberger Naomi, woo! thank you for your support. Angel D, thank you for that super sticker. Steve says, thank you, Tyler, for the great content. Thanks, Steve, for your, appreciating the great content. Appreciate your support. Only eight more super stickers to reach our goal this hour. Uh, Nola Lady says, so Brian Koberger got in his car with a phone in one hand and a knife in the other hand and drove past every camera in the world to get home. Drove up and down the streets trying to park. Parked right in front of the home. And the first door he tried was successful. I mean, those are great observations of essentially what happened. I mean, like a great observations. Interesting. When I looked at this again, it read very much like an appeal to the DoorDash. Okay, we already talked about that. Reply, latest interview with the neighbor who said Brian Koberger brought up the murders a few days after the 13th in conversation, and Brian Koberger noted a crime of passion and no leads, not indicative of having inside knowledge, just a clear sign he was uh, likely reading headlines with all of us. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing that he said it was a crime of passion, but they were also saying it was a crime of passion, like in the news at the time. It was like one of the first things that they came out and said, that it was a, it was a, a crime of passion. So... He could have just been trying to further a rhetoric that he knew wasn't true. You know what I mean? Or, I don't know. You guys tell me what you think was possibly going on there. I'm glad a lot of you guys are keeping up with this case. I think this is going to be a really important case for us in the long run of the American justice system. Wait, 8 to 9 p.m. is the only part of Zan and Ethan's timeline that we know about for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now we have the place to Sigma Chi party from 9 p.m. to 145 by Bethany. So where were they from 8 to 9 p.m.? Where were they when uh, Ethan sent his last Venmo at 840? That's a great question. On the evening of November 12th, Chapin and Kernodal were seen by Bethany at the Sigma Chi house from approximately 9 to 145. Bethany also estimated that at approximately 145, Chapin and Kernodal returned to the King Road residence. Bethany also stated that Chapin did not live in the King Road residence, but was a guest of Kernodal. Yeah. I mean, that Sleuth Goosey's coming up with, uh, you know, some great observations here. It's like, hang on a second. Those two things are not going together. Those two things don't add up. Dear golly. Let's listen to some of this. We don't have time to listen to all of it. I'll fast forward a bit. Somebody that knows and see 
if that's even a thing. Um, but I guess what we'll, what we'll start out, it's interesting. We, I was talking about this in the thread the other day, and I was like, something interesting about this huge dump of warrants was <clears throat> back in February, Andrea Burkhart sent me a message and was like, you know, the data dumps are public records in Idaho. So long as so long as the warrants have been served and the returns been filed, they're they're public records. Um, so you should be able to request them. So I did, and I probably told you guys this, but then so over the course of like three days. Uh, they kept adding people. They kept CCing people to the email. We need to put it in front of the judge. Um, and then on the 9th of February, she said to me that Judge Marshall was looking at it, uh, that it would take obviously longer than the three days that most of their requests are filled in. She couldn't give me a time frame, uh, and they would let me know. And I heard nothing, and I got no follow-up until then this huge dump was sent through. And found out that they literally had a hearing on the 10th. So the day after she told me that the judge was looking at them, they had a meeting and sealed them all. Um, and then yesterday I got an email back saying that it was denied and to just go see the page because all of the information is on the page. Um, I followed up with that and I said, I don't know why I'm telling you guys this. I guess I'm just filling you in to see what we may or may not get, but I followed back up with her and I said, yeah, I saw all of those. I've been through all of them. However, none of them are the warrant for the full life of his phone. So from January to present, um, was not in there anywhere. And also the affidavits, which was the most important part, uh, cause my, the main reason why I sent it in the first place was in reading that PCA, I was like, if he, if his device did not show on the tower dump, where was the probable cause? Like, what did they use as probable cause to then get the 24 hours before and 24 after, 24 hours after the murders? Where did they get the probable cause for that? So the request was for the affidavit, the application, um, and the return for 24 hours before, 24 hours after, and then the next one that they, they themselves in the PCA said that they got, which was June to present uh, for Brian Koberger's phone. They did release the one for 24 hours before and after, but there is no affidavit. And I mean, there's no affidavits for any of these. Um, and so I basically said to her that they weren't on there and she was like, all of the public, all of the publicly available documents are on the website. Uh, they may be sealed. Um, it, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a, I, I, don't, I don't really. Well, several of them turned out not to be sealed, but they were redacted. Uh, Laura, four by four, we haven't gotten to the new theory yet. And again, it's not my theory. It's the theory that the reporter from the Daily Mails came up with. Naomi, thank you for that super sticker. Hey, Jill, thank you for that super sticker. Appreciate you guys. It takes us to 15 on our super sticker train. We only need five more to reach our goal. Wondering if there's five more of you in the next five minutes that want to hop aboard and help us out. No, it's not playing. Well, I guess we're not supposed to listen to that. Um, and again, it was really long. It's like 30, almost four hours. Um, three hours and 50 minutes. Oh, interesting thing about December 7th, since we've been talking about that, December 7th is the same day law enforcement removed belongings from the house and the chief pulled up in a U-Haul. Yeah, I remember that. That's pretty crazy. Hey, Jennifer, thank you for that super sticker. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Patty.
knowing slash having some connections to Brian Koberger doesn't mean that you're involved in the murders. One knife sheath left behind where four people were stabbed multiple times doesn't mean it was the only knife used. And based on my training and experience, isn't a substitute for evidence. It's one of the wisest tweets um, that I've seen somebody put in about this case. Sleuthy saying that based on training experience is not a substitute for evidence because a lot of times we have these experts on the panel on, on News Nation or whatever channel and they go and say the most bizarre things and then people run with them as if they're facts. Based on experience of some person on a panel, it doesn't mean that it's a substitute for evidence. You can't use what somebody says. If I took all the information that all these so-called experts have said and compiled it into something, I, I guarantee you it's not going to end up equaling the same story because one expert says one thing and the other expert contradicts what the other expert had already said. And so it doesn't build a cohesive story. So we can't take experts information and use it as a substitute for evidence. And then the other thing is that I've been saying, and I, Dale Carson said it and Jennifer Confidover said the opposite of it. So you have to choose what you want to believe about this, but one knife sheath doesn't mean that they only used one knife or that it was that. You know what I mean? So. Hey, Jan Martin, thank you for that super sticker. Appreciate your support. <laughs> uh, Naomi, thank you. Naomi's coming in hot today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll be interested in the experts at trial and what they have to say. Very interested in that too, Wyatt. Good to see you too, Wyatt. I uh I hope uh I hope you're you're doing well, man. It's good to see you. Jennifer Koffendoffer made a tweet too that I wanted to share with you guys. Then I have a couple videos I want to go over with you. Um Jennifer says this some wonder if Brian Koberger's parents have visited their son. She said, to my knowledge, no. But Ashley Banfield reported that he has access to FaceTime. Tell me this, guys. Do you think that Brian Koberger's parents have been getting in touch with him via, you know, it's not necessarily FaceTime, but it's, it's digital video? Pamela, I have a question for you. Who's Taylor? Uh, some wonder Brian Koberger's parents put a one in the chat. If you think Brian Koberger's parents have had a conversation with him on FaceTime, put a two in the chat. If you think they visited him physically, put a three in the chat. If you think they've had no contact, I'm going to put a one in the chat. Yeah, most of you guys are saying one. I think if they would have went there in person, like physically in person, we would have known about it. So Jennifer Coffin Draffer says, in my search for the answer, I found interesting sentiments of the mother who was writing in the Pocono Daily Record. My heart goes out to her. Um, she says, when not consuming, when not consuming coverage of himself, Cobra can reach out to loved ones. The jail allows him to make but not receive calls. If he gets a call, the jailer will pass him a note and he has the option to call or FaceTime them back. This is what his mom wrote in the Pocono magazine or whatever. I do not personally support abortion and by all means do not support the death penalty. That's a letter that she wrote to the editor in March 2008. So here's a family who doesn't believe in the death penalty and it's likely that Brian Koberger will be facing the death penalty himself. His mom, someone who wrote, I found things that she's written, both published on the Pocono Daily Record, and then also uh, not even things that she had published, but but things that uh, she had left as a comment, like in the comment section on the Pocono Daily Record. 
Do all prisoners get that in jail? The tablets and video visits, yes, that's for all inmates, unless they're ineligible due to behavioral issues. While in jail, myself saw a message passed to an inmate to call home as her husband had passed, but doubt I could call and leave the message for Brian Koberger to call me back. Hmm. Yeah, some of that information feels like a stretch. Like, I don't even know if we can really trust the sources that are being said to us. Uh, here's the Idaho County thing. Inmates have access to telephones to make outgoing collect calls only. You can set up account by going to gettingout.com. If you call the jail, you will not be able to reach an inmate to put in money on an inmate's account. You call the sheriff's office. You can use the kiosk in the lobby, the phone number, website listed above. Sheriff's office will not accept property. Hmm. The jail's library consists of books, a pull-up bar, and a dip bar. We also have an outdoor recreation yard. Both the library and recreation yard are constantly monitored. In inmates are allowed one hour per day in either location for or a combination of both. Hmm. Interesting. Inmate mail, inmate telephone services. However, Jennifer Koffendoffer did post saying that since COVID, they've allowed video calls in place of physical uh, physical conversation. Uh, you said, can you please show us to tell us what your PayPal looks like? Yeah, my PayPal is just Tyler Feller. It's down there on the bottom of the screen, Friendly Frog. Thank you for asking. Appreciate anybody's support through PayPal, which is Tyler Feller, Cash App, dollar sign, Tyler Feller 22, or Venmo, which is at Tyler hyphen Feller. You can also send on Zelle, which is press at TylerFeller.com. I think Oh, yeah, Bar I think Barbara sent a gift. Let me check. Yeah, Barbara sent a gift over on Zelle today. Thank you, Barbara, for, for sending that. Why have you ever read any of the uh, Theodore Boone books? I think you'd like them because it's a kid who... Uh, really interested in court cases and he kept trying to get out of school to go to court to watch in person different trials that John Grisham wrote them. John Grisham wrote these books called Theodore Boone. It's about a 14-year-old that is an attorney. Well, he wants to be an attorney. His parents are attorneys. Okay, I want to play this video from the Daily Mail. This is called New Theory. Collateral damage, new theory. We're going to watch it together, and uh, and we'll we'll unpack it. How's that sound, folks? By the way, I want you to know if you're watching right now, how much I appreciate you, care about you. Thank you so much for being a part of this amazing community here. We try to build a positive, uplifting, encouraging place for anybody who watches this channel, and it, you guys encourage me, uplift me, and so I just want to say thank you for being a part of our community here. For everybody who's a subscriber to this channel, everybody who watches the videos and comments, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I'm so glad that you're part of what we're doing here, and it really does mean the world. Haley, Zana, and Ethan were the victims of a murderer who police believe methodically planned exactly how he would slip into their home under the cover of night armed with a knife to commit murder. Now, these four innocent victims ended up in the crosshairs of a cold-blooded killer, but I suspect that three of them may have actually been collateral damage. And to understand why, we have to try to get inside of the alleged killer's mind. Let's go back. So essentially what she's trying to say, which is an interesting perspective, is that everybody else who died in the house died by accident, essentially is what she's saying. Uh, she's like one of them was a target. Everybody else was just unnecessarily colla unnecessary collateral damage. So, hey Naomi, woo! That's hey, I think that's the biggest super sticker of the day. Coming in hot. Thank you so much for your support. You said thanks for being you. Thank you, Naomi, for being you. I really appreciate your support, and it means a lot too that we're we're a little behind on our <clears throat> just ability to have super stickers or whatever this month. And so thank you for, you're really helping us out tonight. And I, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. 
back to November 12th. It was a game day for the University of Idaho Vandals. Students partied, they drank, they laughed, they got home late, they went to bed. But for four of them, they wouldn't live to see the 13th. Now, I have spent months investigating the horrific events which transpired that night to make sense of it all, but according to theories by police, the fates of Zana, Ethan, Kaylee, and Maddie were sealed long before November. Now, on the day of his arrest, police searched Koberger's apartment and Washington State University office looking for proof that he methodically planned his alleged crime. Investigators said in their search warrant affidavit that they were confident that Brian Koberger planned his actions ahead of time, likely at his residence or office. Now, police firmly believe that the quadruple homicide was premeditated and not something that just happened in the heat of the moment. But what does premeditation look like? Well, in this case, detectives think that the suspect made plans by researching other violent assaults like stabbings, as well as ways to avoid getting caught. They also believe that Brian Koberger stalked the residents of 1122 King Road for weeks before the murders. We're looking here at the back of the house. Screen still on the ground. Dylan's room. It's a common space. I wonder if... I wonder why they were zooming in on the boots a second ago on the video. That was really interesting. Oh, Friendly Frog, thank you so much. You said I sent you a donation on PayPal. Well, thank you so much for sending that gift on PayPal. I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Hey, Amy Heights. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Laura 4x4 says, I 100% agree. I think one or two were intended. Two or three were Laura. Collateral damage, sadly, wrong place, wrong time. Right, that's the question I have, too. Were Kaylee and Maddie both intended and Ethan and Xana were collateral damage or was just one, either Kaylee or Maddie, intended and the other three were collateral damage? I don't know the answer to that, if it's one or two or two or three, but I, I'm very interested in, in finding out, so... Oh, you sent a gift on Venmo. Thank you so much. I have to check it out. Yep, I got a, I, uh, I got a Venmo. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you guys for coming through on on Venmo and Cash App and things like that too. It means the world. Every time anybody donates to, just even throughout the day when we're not streaming, I always write it down and just I pray and thank God for every single person that's able to help support what we're doing here. So thank you guys for your support. Since day one, police have said that the quadruple homicide was targeted and sources close to the investigation have indicated that it was just one target. Kaylee's family believes it was her. But how did one target become four bodies and also leave two survivors? Well, it's my opinion that the suspected killer had planned to slaughter just one single victim that night, but that his plan went awry when he got in the house. Now, based on everything I know about the case, I'm fairly confident Zana and Ethan were collateral damage as well as one of the other two victims, but I'm not sure just who quite yet. It seems that the alleged killer may have been obsessed with only one of the girls in the house. A source with knowledge of the investigation recently told People Magazine that Koberger's phone contained multiple images of one of the victims. So it's my opinion that law enforcement will likely find more images and information. I'm curious, if you guys think it's Maddie or Kaylee, would you put it in the chat? Who do you guys think that was the one that was sort of like the object of Brian Koberger's affection. A lot of you guys are saying Maddie. That's really surprising to me because I thought it was Kaylee. But most of you guys are saying Maddie in the comment section. And the reason I thought it was Kaylee was because she had the most significant wounds. So. But most of you guys are saying Maddie. That's really surprising. Kaylee's the one that had sort of the bigger social media following, was definitely more active. So, very interesting.
information in their digital investigation that will zero in on a single victim. Now, the source also told the outlet that Koberger followed Kaylee, Maddie, and Zana on social media, but repeatedly messaged only one of them. Now, on the night of the murders, the surviving roommate first heard noises of the intruder on the third floor. That is where the killings most likely started. Bearing that in mind, I think either Kaylee or Madison were the intended target, and the other was just killed because of sheer bad luck because they were in the same room. I believe the killer had a well-thought-out plan, and that plan that they had laid out in painstaking detail went totally wrong. I don't think the killer expected Maddie and Kaylee to be in the same bed, and that is where things just went off the rails. As for Xana, she was awake. An interesting point, right? She's like, I don't think they were, he was expecting them to be in the same bed. And I don't think so either. I don't think he was expecting them to be in the same bed at all. So that's a good catch on the theory. If I had to build a case for saying that Maddie was the intended target, one of the reasons I would say that would be because Kaylee didn't live at the house anymore. She'd already moved out. She was just back visiting for the weekend and show off the Range Rover that she had bought. She wanted to show it to Maddie and her other friends. So there was a perspective from that view that basically is saying like, um, you know, Kaylee wasn't even supposed to be there. So Maddie would have likely been the been the target then for that reason. Hey Jess, are you said thank you for all you do? Thank you. I appreciate your support. You're welcome. Thank you. Chris Hoyt said the greater trauma to Kaylee's neck area screams personal rage towards her, in my opinion. Yeah. If you go by the wounds, it it appears as if, you know, Kaylee would have been the intended target. So but circumstantially you could build a case that maddie was the target so really interesting tiffany says xana has been my gut feeling target that's interesting and it could be we could be caught by surprise you know it could be i don't personally that's not what i think i thought kaylee has been and was the was the target the entire time but it for all we know there's a lot of of information that we don't have and it could very well have been Zana. That is where things just went off the rails. As for Zana, she was awake at the time of the killings, and it's my assertion that the killer realized she was up and had to kill her in order to keep her quiet. The surviving roommate heard crying from Zana's room, and the killer trying to calm her down by lying and saying he was going to help her before stabbing her to death. That would mean that Ethan, who was sleeping in Zana's bedroom, his girlfriend's bedroom, was most likely killed because he was just in the room when Zana was slaughtered. It's my opinion that the suspect never intended on having multiple victims, but likely felt he had to kill the three others, which is also why I think that there were two survivors left unharmed. Not only do I think the suspected killer had just one target, but I also think he became obsessed with that target months prior. Koberger moved from his home in Pennsylvania to Washington State University in June of 2022 to get his doctorate in criminology. And it wasn't long before cops believed he started showing up at the victim's home. Before his arrest, investigators obtained a search warrant for Koberger's historical cell phone data. And as early as August 21st, his phone pinged a tower covering 1122 King Road. That's more than two months before the murders. And on that first night, his phone allegedly was in the area for an hour from about 10.30 to 11.30 p.m. The thought of someone just lurking outside of your home at that time of night on its face value is creepy. But just picture what Koberger could have seen. There's a parking lot behind the structure attached to a small apartment complex. From there, you could slip out of your car pretty much unnoticed and just watch. That vantage point looks directly into Kaylee's bedroom. But she actually went there and sort of scoped it out herself, this reporter, Caitlin Becker, and pretty much determined like this, she thinks would have been the vantage point that Koberger for the 12 times that he was stalking outside the house would have been watching. And so it's looking pretty much directly into Maddie's bedroom. So 
you guys tell me what you think. I mean, like she's building a case essentially that Maddie's the Maddie's the target, I guess, is what it sounds like to me. Man, this is so heartbreaking. What a sad case. What a very sad situation. Golly. You said every time I see this house, I get chills. I know it's hard. Every time I see the house, I'm filled with sadness. I think about four lives that were, you know, taken way too soon. Into Maddie's bedroom, into the kitchen and the living room. Based on phone records, police believe Koberger went to the home and watched the house, not once, not twice, but 12 times from late August until November. Where I'm standing is the vantage point that the alleged killer would have had if he parked back here, which is where the Hyundai was seen and what cops believe happened. And this right here is the foundation to Zana's room. You can still actually see, even after all these weeks, the drips and, and drops of blood right there that had come out from the foundation. And of course, we now know that Zana was found on the floor of her bedroom, so that would make a lot of sense. Drips that are now blood. Uh, Tiffany says, DoorDash to Zana Kernodal is fishy in my gut. Yeah, I know. It is kind of weird, like... I, especially since they got home at one forty-five, like they'd been home for two and a half hours. You'd think they would have been exhausted and tired by then or at, been able to scrounge up a snack somewhere in the house to do a whole DoorDash order at four in the morning. I didn't even know you could do door, DoorDash orders at four in the morning. You certainly can't do DoorDash orders. I don't think in Nashville at four in the morning where I live. And there are plenty of colleges in Nashville. There's Tennessee Tech, there's Vanderbilt, there's Fisk University. I mean, there's some big universities in my city. So it's not necessarily a college town, but there is a bunch of college students. It's it's more of a tourist town, which means it'd be even more likely that things like that would be open around 4 a.m. But every time that like I'll have guests or something over when we'll do a, a, a ministry night or something, and I'll try to order some kind of like delivery service for food if we need something even if it's after like 11 the only thing that's available most of the time is pizza so it's kind of a an interesting perspective to be like four in the morning that is kind of a strange strange time and it seems he didn't just spend time by the house he is also suspected of loitering around campus a sophomore at the University of Idaho told a People reporter that they saw Brian at the Student Union. Now, a student at the Student Union is not weird. But remember, Koberger went to a completely different university. And this sophomore said, quote, he was the type to stare. He wouldn't look away if you caught him staring like he wanted you to notice he was looking at you. And another student said that they saw him so often on the University of Idaho campus that they just assumed he was enrolled there. Now, I have been to both the University of Idaho and Washington State University campuses. There is no reason that I can think of to just be hanging out at the other campus unless you were there to meet someone, or what I believe happened in this case was to watch someone. Police seized Koberger's cell phone at the time of his arrest, as well as a computer tower and a fire TV stick from his apartment to see if he left any kind of search history showing an interest in or planning of murder, violent assault, stabbing, and or cutting of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just not a good sentence. Planning of murder, violent assault, stabbing, or cutting of people? Yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, guys, we're entering our second and our last hour of the show. I want to extend an invitation for, for people to hop aboard our Super Sticker train. We're going to go after 17 Super Chats this hour, the last hour of the show. Just an invitation for people to support us if you want to and if you're able to. I know everybody with watching is not able to do that. And so if you're not able to, a free way you can help us is just by hitting the like button or subscribing. You can also download this amazing app that we're a part of called Swag It. It features some of my favorite true crime creators that are posting nearly daily content on there in a vertical format and short videos of less than one minute. So I'd go, if I were you, click the link, download the app, follow me at Tyler Feller. You're automatically injured to win $250. Um, the other ways you can support is through PayPal, which is Tyler Feller, Cash App, dollar sign Tyler Feller 22, or Venmo at Tyler hyphen Feller.
Thank you guys for those of you that are able to support. We already have two super stickers. We have Amy Heights and Chris. Uh, Chris says, what if Brian Koberger ordered the DoorDash as a distraction? I thought about that, but when they pulled those warrants out, they would have been able to know if it came from Xana's account or if it came from Brian Koberger's account. So they did a search warrant of every single DoorDash delivery that was sent to the house. They submitted that search warrant on December 6th. Uh, that's, that warrant was delivered to them on December 7th. So they would have had the full information of every single DoorDash order, who ordered it, who delivered it, you know, from what account. So that if it was a new Xana Kernod account, they would have definitely known. So I've thought about that. And certainly that hasn't been anything that they've said to us publicly, but it's an interesting perspective, Chris. I, I mean, it's something that crossed my brain too. Hey, Cajun, thank you for that super sticker. Laura, four by four, thank you. Patty, really appreciate your support. Thank you guys. That's five on, the, on our way to 17. You guys came in real fast on that one. Uh, thank you so much. As well as details about the home at 1122 King Road, the surrounding neighborhood, or any of the victims or survivors. They're also hoping that his digital devices will offer up clues as to other locations where evidence, like the murder weapon, may be found. Connecting Koberger directly to the knife used in the stabbings will be key for prosecutors. His DNA was already allegedly found on the snap of the knife sheath, according to law enforcement, but that is still not the knife itself, not the murder weapon. The knife used in the slayings had to be obtained from somewhere, and police believe that Koberger went out and bought it sometime before the crime. Investigators may have found evidence of this already. The search of Koberger's apartment turned up a Walmart receipt as well as two Marshall's receipts. Now these receipts hold some significance. When cops execute a search warrant, they can only look for a specific list of items pertaining to the crime, and they only seize materials believed to have probative value in the case. Now to be crystal clear here, we don't know what was on these receipts what specifically he bought at Walmart, but Walmart does sell fixed blade K-Bar knives and a K-Bar knife sheath was left at the crime scene and the medical examiner confirmed the four victims were killed by a fixed blade knife. Brian Koberger is a unique suspect because he has a long time academic interest in crimes and criminals. His master's degree is in criminal justice and he was a criminology PhD student at the time of the murders. So his academic research into the criminal mind goes back. That's one of the most fascinating parts of this case to me is the fact that Brian Koberger does have an academic mind and the academics that he studies have centered around uh, criminal justice system but not only that it desails it centers more around serial killers i mean that sort of is one of the focuses of his professors there and so like it matters what your teachers have an emphasis in for example it's seminary for me i have a, a professors that their goal is to think about healing and and what it means to pray for healing so uh, a lot of my seminaries sort of focused around that. Other seminaries are focused around other things, different parts of theology. And so you can sort of look at the professors, especially the ones that are highly esteemed in the departments, and say, well, what are they focused on? Because that's what the content and the curriculum is going to be sort of developed around. Well, when we look at the case of uh, of, of Brian Koberger at DeSales University, we see professors like Catherine Ramsland who wrote the book, called How to Catch Them Before They Do It or whatever it is and written several other books about serial killers. And I, you know, I, I, I always kind of thought like, well, nobody was able to catch Brian Koberger. But recently I read a report that said Brian Koberger did his, did his entire master's degree online. And so if he did his entire master's degree online, it, I mean, it makes sense. Nobody was really interacting with him personally. He was just submitting papers and did a really good job on them. So and that part makes sense to me. Hey, Sweet Dreams, thank you so much for that. Tim, how are you? Thank you for that super sticker. I really appreciate that. Hey, Latresa, you said good evening. So glad to see you live. I'm glad to be live. I haven't been live very much. Obviously, lately I've been on assignment uh, doing ministry events literally around the world. But I'm back, and I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad to be live uh, thank you for your super chat. Really appreciate that. But yeah, I think that Brian Koberger 
either intentionally chose that university because he liked the fact that they were they were studying um, serial killers, but I don't think that's actually what happened. He this was the university that was close to his house. I think he just started attending this university. That's what I think happened. I think Brian Koberger just started attending this university, to Sales University, because it was the one that was close to his house. He did a psychology degree, and then he thought, well, why don't I try the criminal justice master's program? Went into the criminal justice master's program and had his interest peaked about serial killers. That's what I think happened. I think it was a degree at a university that was close to him, and then he had his interest peaked. And then after his interest was peaked, he spiraled and thinking about it and obsessing over it. That's personally what I think happened as far as his educational pursuits. So I'd love to hear what you guys think. If you agree with my theory, I think that's a really interesting theory. Hey, Tiffany, you said, in my opinion, the DoorDasher was an accomplice. You know, it is interesting. They haven't said much information about the DoorDash. That's sort of what Sleuthy Goosey was saying on her, on her Twitter account. Um, we don't know who the DoorDash driver was. So, but they did supposedly clear the DoorDash di driver, but sometimes they clear people just to say they're clear when they're not actually clear. So it's hard to know what's true and what's not true. <laughs> hey, Tim, you said maybe we can be in prayer that he confessed and states why he did it. The family deserves to know why. I know that's the, that is one of my prayers, Tim. It's, it's a 100% great perspective and point to have like 100% great point to have because if he just would confess and, and explain the reasons why, it's not going to bring their families back, but it helps make more sense of it. And I think about like the Alec Murdoch case. How ridiculous is it? Alec Murdoch was unanimous, unanimously chosen as guilty. And, you know, when I'm thinking about what took place, like I wish he would just say yes or no. Like I wish we would just know for sure. There's always doubt. Like people to this day, are going to defend Alec Murdoch and say he's innocent. And uh, and they're going to appeal it, and there's going to be this whole hoopla that happens around that case. And the judge thought he was guilty. You could tell. And if he did it, I wish he would have just said, I did it, and this is why. So I, I, I wish Brian Koberger would do the same thing. If he did it, I wish he'd just confess and say, this is why. Naomi, thank you for that super sticker. Timmy said, by the way, Tyler, hope all's well. Thank you. I'm really tired because I've been traveling like a wild man. But other than that, things are well. Hey, Angel, you said we could all pray for Brian, Brian Koberger to tell all the trial. That'd be great. I think that is a prayer we should have. I think the family should know what was going on in his sick mind. Not only that, but I think it would help future, future cases. So, hey, Rochelle, they said, well, they had a crime house at that university. Um... At Washington State University, they had a crime lab. Whenever he did DeSales University, he did the master's degree online. So if they would have had a crime house or a crime lab, he wouldn't have participated with it because he, he was doing his studies online. So, But I, I think that's why he chose Washington State University. Once he was in it, he was peaked. And Washington, University, Washington State University apparently has a really good crime lab system. They have access to body cam footages. You have to do FBI level two clearance to even get accepted into the program because the level of access of information that they're going to be giving you. So, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Thank you, Rochelle, for your super chat. Takes us to 14 on our super sticker train. We're trying to get to 17. Almost there. Years as part of his master's program at DeSales University. Now there, Koberger studied under world-renowned professor Catherine Ramsland, and true crime junkies will no doubt recognize her name. She has done extensive research into the minds of serial killers, specifically her relationship and book on BTK. Koberger also conducted a research project into convicted criminals, and he asked them a series of survey questions. For a criminal justice researcher, these questions are kind of par for the course, but I mean, these survey questions I thought were really interesting, too. How'd you accomplish your goal? Tell me what you were thinking. Before making your move, how'd you approach the victim? Did you prepare for the crime? It's almost like he himself is learning how to do those crimes. I mean, it's almost like he's processing through how is he going to be able to do them himself. 
Hey, CJ, you said, I can't believe Brent Koberger had a teacher that studied living serial killers and didn't pick up a Brent Koberger. I felt the same way. I did. I felt the same way until I realized that he, that he never had her in class, like in person, because he was just doing it online. I mean, I've taken a lot of online classes in my day, and I, like, I know nothing about the professors. I know nothing about the other students I have. I only see what they post on the discussion board, and I don't even get to read their papers. So, I mean, I could see now, since it was totally online, why she didn't pick up on it. When they had supposedly been meeting in person, that's when I was like, mm, that, was, that would have been weird to me if, if they had a lot of personal interaction and she didn't pick up on it. By the way, guys, I'd love it if we can get five new people to join our membership program today called the Feller Fam. Uh, lots of great, 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 great opportunity um, in our Feller, Feller Fam. You can join our Facebook group. So uh, you get a little flag next to your name. Just be awesome if you wanted to join our membership program. But in light of the crime that he has been accused of, some experts have suggested that Koberger may have been trying to study the mistakes and the minds of other criminals to create a blueprint for himself. Now, let me show you an example of some of these questions. Now, these are his specific questions. Why did you choose that victim or target over others? What was the first move you made to accomplish your goal? Did you prepare for the crime before leaving your home? Knowledge of the quadruple homicide now makes these questions in retrospect seem sinister and not academic, and I want to point out the usage of the term goal here. We're talking about crimes, sometimes violent crimes, being referred to as a goal, a term most of us consider to be positive. So is that how Brian Koberger views violent crimes as a goal to achieve? Were these questions a method to weed out mistakes before acting on his own violent impulses? I don't know, and we may never know the answer. The answer might not even matter. There's a good chance that this survey will not make it into trial, so a jury may never hear it. But if a judge does allow it in, the defense may utilize it as a way to plant the seed of reasonable doubt by explaining away all of this research or any research or Google searches found into violent stabbings. Yeah, I mean, that is true. It, she's making a great point. They will definitely be able to to unpack all of that stuff. They'd be like, hey, listen, he was a PhD student studying this type of stuff. Obviously, he's going to have weird Google searches. Hey, Wade, welcome to the Feller fam. Glad you joined, man. Really appreciate that. Don't forget to join our Facebook group called Feller fam if you have, if you have Facebook. Rochelle says, Brian said exonerated and not guilty on purpose. I agree with that. I agree with that. I think he thinks he's going to get a guilty verdict and then he's going to figure out how to be exonerated on it. You're exactly, he didn't say acquitted. He didn't say not guilty. He said exonerated. And this is somebody who has uh, obviously knowledge of how the justice system works at a graduate level. I mean, PhD somewhat, he just started a PhD program, PhD level for sure, a master's degree level. So. Potentially on Koberger's devices, simply just him doing his schoolwork. It will ultimately be up to a jury to decide whether the suspect is a premeditated murderer or an innocent criminology student. But if Koberger is convicted and sentenced to the death penalty, he may face a firing squad. He may face the firing squad. If you enjoyed this video. New reporting this week on accused Idaho murderer Brian Koberger. And his life of flying under the radar before allegedly murdering the four victims in Idaho. We now know a lot more about his backstory. After graduating from Pleasant Valley High School in Pennsylvania's Pocono Mountains in 2013, he would only venture about 35 miles to begin his college career. It's here at DeSales University in the Lehigh Valley where Koberger would spend a significant portion of his 20s. The sales is kind of its own sort of campus outside of Bethlehem in a more rural area surrounded by a lot. Not the Bethlehem from the Bible. Sandy says, did he study Elliot Roger in university? I don't know. You'd assume that he probably did. Uh, but that would be an interesting one to figure out. Like maybe we can get the curriculum vitae or whatever it's called or the syllabus 
from DeSales University. And actually, it's not a bad idea. Let me see if I can find it real fast. DeSales University uh, Criminology Program. Sometimes you can get uh, syllabuses online from courses. Master's Program. Master's in Criminal Justice. Okay. All right. I'm on the website. DeSales University. Criminal justice. <laughs> I see the crime scene house that they were talking about. I'll show you guys a picture of it in just a second. Uh, I'll put the video of it up. This is what uh, the person on the super chat. Who was that in the super chat? Said that a second ago. I think it was Rochelle. Uh, Rochelle, yeah, Rochelle was saying talking about the crime scene house at DeSales University. Here's the crime scene house. So that's kind of a weird crime scene house that they have. But Brian Koberg would have been getting his master's degree during COVID and he was doing it online. So I don't know. But anyways, uh, I'm, it, you gave me something to think about as far as like master's degree if they studied Elliot Rogers. I'd have to go. I really want to download the, uh, gosh, curriculum. Here's the curriculum. Advanced criminology, research methods, ethics, master project, seminar, criminal justice, applied statistics, which is a crappy course. Personally, I've had to take that class. National criminal justice, online learning. So I don't know. I, they don't have their syllabus as public, but it'd be interesting. Hey, Angel, you said, are errors in affidavits good ammo for the defense? No, because the, the, the information on affidavits doesn't even have to be correct, to be honest. It just has to compel the grand jury to allow the warrant to go forward. And so we see all the time affidavits have incorrect information. But that's a great point. Amy Heights, thank you for that super sticker. Appreciate your support. You guys are amazing. Elliot Roger, not Rogers. Sorry if we triggered you. Pennsylvania's Pocono Mountains in 20 campus outside of Bethlehem in a more rural area surrounded by a lot of uh, cornfields uh, and small neighborhoods. In fact, it was the sort of small campus, less than 5,000 students, where a student could typically not enjoy the anonymity that you know, one might be able to at nearby universities like Penn State. But Koberger may have been the exception, as one former classmate remembered. It's a very small school in a cornfield. So if, if you go there, you, you know most of the people within your, um, within your study. and pretty much everyone that goes to the school, and he was not known. Known or not, Brian Koberger would wind up getting both his undergraduate and a graduate degree at DeSales in the studies of psychology and criminology, and that's where he came in contact with classmate Josh Ferraro, his future lab partner, who said this about Koberger. At that time, I would have never said, oh yeah, that guy would, would do something like this. He may have been a little odd or a little off, 
but like other than that, you'd never expect someone to to be allegedly part of a quadruple homicide ever. And when Koberger transitioned from undergraduate to graduate student at DeSales, he also switched from a major in psychology to a focus on criminal justice. While he had no official criminal record during his time as an undergrad and grad student, according to multiple reports, Koberger would spend a lot of time at a bar called the Seven Sirens Brewing Company. According to interviews, he made multiple women uncomfortable to a point where a record of his interactions were kept as his odd behavior was a concern to the staff. Now, being the creepy guy in a bar doesn't make him a killer. But the evidence that has come out was enough to change his former lab partner's mind. God forbid if he didn't do it, great. But all the signs point to that he did. Unless this guy was miraculously set up, which is like a one in a billion chance, you know, no one cares enough about Brian Koberger to set him up. In fact, Ferraro goes on to say that he thinks there are specific studies, state studies, played a role in Koberger's actions. The course that I took that stands out is psychological sleuthing, where you basically enter the mind of a killer. She would give you... That's what I was about to say. I was about to pull up Katherine Ramson's classes that she takes, or that she teaches, and she teaches one class called psychological sleuthing. She teaches another class called Dangerous Minds. And so I think that those two classes are pretty significant. She, te- she literally teaches a class called Psychological Sleuthing. That sounds freaky deaky if I've ever heard about it myself. I mean, it sounds kind of interesting. Like, I kind of want to take the class. But at the same time, like, when, you, when you're giving someone like Brian Koberger access to information that we don't necessarily think he needs, it could st- stir him up in the wrong way. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy class, which is apparently what happened. She may need to rethink her methods. Hey, Patty Davila, thank you for that super sticker. Really appreciate that. Sheets, and basically the sheets would denote in detail um, a crime. However, you wouldn't know who did what per se or where this was, but you'd have to, it was a group thing, so you'd get partnered up or in groups, and you would go through these um, activities and basically come up with a, a theory or a thesis. And DeSales is known for its criminology studies. They have uh, an entire house. They call it the crime scene house that is used for simulations for crime scene investigation or collecting evidence or crime scene photography or responding to other emergencies. But on top of all that, Brian Koberger's studies of the criminal mind didn't end at DeSales. Just months later, he'd moved cross-country and began his Ph.D. studies at Washington State University. He'd even received an appointment as a teaching assistant during the fall of the 2022 semester, but he reportedly be fired from that job over, quote, behavioral problems and having a sexist attitude towards women. Joining us now is Sierra Gillespie, a reporter for the Law and Crime Network, who did a, a terrific in-depth story, which uncovered a lot of new information about Koberger's background and back with us is Jesse Weber. Um, uh, Sierra, let me start with you. You spent a lot of time digging into his background. What surprised you most? I think the most interesting thing about Brian Koberger is that he flew under the radar. So a lot of the people that I spoke with said that when they first heard the name Brian Koberger, when he was named a suspect in these murders, they thought, "Mm, that name's kind of familiar to me, but who is that? How do I know him? Koberger didn't really make a big mark on a lot of people when they had to go back into their memories from years ago and think, oh, I knew that guy. What they were thinking is that he was kind of odd. He was kind of off. He kept himself. A lot of people told me that he was a loner throughout his entire collegiate studies. So that's something that's really interesting now that we're learning more about him. So he's getting, he's studying criminology at DeSales and then he's studying it more at the University of Washington? That is correct. So he studied his undergraduate and graduate degrees at the sales, which really, you heard it there, has a very robust criminal justice program with some of the world-renowned professors. He studied there and then was working on his PhD in Washington. So really doubling down on learning more about this field. Thank you for watching. Go to News Nation. Thank you for watching. Go to News Nation. All right, folks, thank you for being a part of the stream tonight. That's pretty much all I have to say to you. Uh, thank you so much for your support. I want to encourage you to continue to support us through Super Sticker, Super Chat, PayPal, Cash App, Dollar Sign Telephone 22 or Venmo, downloading the Swagit app, 
liking, subscribing. Uh, let me pray for you before we get off the stream tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every single person that you brought together on the stream. I thank you that there are people who've been encouraged uh, just even by getting an opportunity to spend time with other people that they can talk to today. Lord, I pray that they actually sense your love right now in a brand new way in the name of Jesus, that your love would come upon them. Lord, I pray for the victims of this atrocity that took place in Idaho, that they would send your love and kindness tonight as well. So we bless them with your nearness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for being a part of the stream. If you guys don't mind, hey, Jill, thank you for that super sticker. If you guys don't mind leaving a comment on this video as soon as we end, that would be a major blessing as well. And we'll see you soon.